I was born in Clinton Indian Hospital on the 4th of July, 1948. And then I grew up in uh, the town of Watonga, Oklahoma. But there were seven miles out, you know, they call it out in the country, where uh, west of Watonga, where we grew up, and there was a community hall there. And then I spent part of my time in uh, Gary, where my grandfather is from. That was 12 miles out from west of Gary. So I spent some time out in the country. And then at five years old, I was at St. Patrick's in Anadarko. It was a mission school, Catholic mission school. And then I, I came back, uh, my parents, I had, I'm second to the youngest. I have uh, three sisters and uh, four brothers. There were eight of us in the family. And they were, um, my father had his children and my mother. And then here was, um, so I had stepbrothers and sisters. Blended family, they call it. So we grew up here, and then we would go back and forth uh, traveling uh, to see my other grandparents in Wyoming, my father's parents, and then in Montana, Lame Deer, Montana, and then uh, Arapaho, Wyoming. First, my grandmother, my mother taught me. My grandma would, would make dolls together. And then my mother, from my grandmother and my mother did beadwork. So I, I learned how to do beadwork. Moccasins, buckskin dress, you know, everything in a woman is what they need. When I was 12 years old, I was uh, called to be in the Kit Fox, one of the sacred um, women, girls in Kit Fox clan, in 1950, I think. And I was 12. And then um, when I went to boarding school here at Concho, and then I graduated from eighth grade. And then I went to uh, Shilako. Graduated from high school from there. And the, um, in between those times, we were very traditional family. So Native American church was my mother's, my grandfather's. So I come from, I'm third generation from that. Native American church, and when um, they established it, and it was it was very important to my mother and my grandfather, and his brothers and his his uh, family, you know, and how we how they uh, that movement was. My mother even went to jail. My she's my grandfather. They. They all went to jail for that religion, they call it. So I saw that from my mother's side. And um, today I still practice that. And uh, so I got married. Uh, we had to be, um, tell the superintendent at after high school, what if we're going to college, if we're going to go to trade school, we had to have a plan and accept it. So I got accepted in uh, Albuquerque nursing school. And I married my, um, my husband, it was Coach de Pueblo. And my uh, mother-in-law saw me making a pair of moccasins, all beaded. She, she saw me how I would do beadwork and 
how I would sell it to pay some of our bills. And, and I think she pitied me, she felt sorry for me. She, she showed me, she gave it to me, you know, like a little ceremony. She took me to the mountain and she said, here's the clay. You pray over it and you use it. To, you find your own texture. And um, was my teacher in making pottery. It was my other two sister-in-laws and I. So we were, we were making pottery, you know, this storyteller dolls. And I really enjoyed it. I, the first night I, I mixed my clay, I made a hundred little ones. And I had them under this plastic bang. She used to come in and house check to see we have uh, clean houses, you know. She really told us, always clean your house, you know. And my sister-in-law, we would warn each other, you know, she would say, Mom's headed to your house, you know, are you ready? <laughs> She's going to check your house to see if it's clean. And she saw these dolls. She said, what's in here? She opened it up. She said, oh, my goodness. It's like I just took off and made all these dolls, little miniature. And she grabbed my hand. She said, you've got magic hands, she said. So I started. And it was very um, therapeutic for me because it was very difficult during that time having three children, alcoholic husband, you know, and I made, I made a living like I was a single parent, you know. It's my father's Northern Cheyenne and Northern Rappo. His mother's Northern Rappo and his father's Northern Cheyenne. And we were, I always heard these stories, you know, there was a Cheyenne breakout and they escaped from Fort Reno from here and they went back 130 Northern Cheyennes. I believe that I had a transition in my life and enlightenment, you know, after my struggles being married and becoming uh, alcoholic and how I struggled through through these uh, social problems. And then I became um, a substance abuse, you know, counselor. I went to UNM, the psychology department and their program, Bill Miller's, and then here was um, I worked at Hamas, and all of a sudden I just came to me. I'm moving to Montana to find my father's people, family, you know, his go to uh, Montana. So it was like in November, and my boss, he said, we need you here, you know. I said, no, I made, I made up my mind, I'm going. And I was in recovery, you know, for a few years. And my whole life changed. You know, I was finding myself putting everything in order. You know, I had already um, made amends with my husband, my children. It was an empty nest. And, and I came through um, alcoholism, got sober. And I was like, in a very uh, special place in my life. Enlightenment, I guess they call it, transition. Something happened to me. I can't really explain it. It was my father's Northern Cheyenne and Northern Rappo. His mother's Northern Rappo and his father's Northern Cheyenne. And we were, I always heard these stories, you know, there was a Cheyenne breakout and they escaped from Fort Reno from here and they went back 130 Northern Cheyennes. I believe it was something important, you know, the way he would talk about it while well, he, was, he was Northern Cheyenne. And then I was always curious, you know, well, here's my mother, Southern Cheyenne, here's my father, Northern Cheyenne and Northern Rappo. 
And here I am, I got enrolled under my mother, as here it's a Cheyenne Rappel. And I was in recovery, you know, for a few years. And my whole life changed, you know, I was finding myself putting everything in order. You know, I had already um, made amends with my husband, my children, it was empty nest. And, and I came through um, alcoholism, got sober, and I was like in a very uh, special place in my life. Enlightenment, I guess they call it, transition, something happened to me. I can't really explain it. And then so I was staying with my daughter in Taos before I, I had my car all packed with my clothes, moving to Montana. She came and she had this letter. She said, Mom, who do you know in California? That's where the letter was from. And I opened it and it was inviting me to Phoenicia, New York. To, to a woman's gathering. So like I was plucked out in my life and I accepted it, I went. And there were all these people there. And I was like, wow, this is really important. Wilma Mankiller was there. Alice Walker, Glorious Time. Um, there, were, there were important women there. And there I was and I was, you know, figuring, thinking, this is something. It was in 2004, and then we f I found my name on this round table. And they told me to bring my regalia, you know. And then I saw, I saw the other women, the 12 women, somewhere in their regalia and somewhere just in regular street clothes but it was quite amazing then we formed a council there and our mission statement world peace healing mother earth and her inhabitants oh i was just excited about that i said i get to be a part of this movement work i didn't know anything i was like green as a but I was going, I was willing to. Then we started our next council. Was, we're, we decided to become a council. We decided to go to each grandmother's home, home place, homeland, to have council. So we started this uh, Flor de Mayo, who was my own grandma. She was living in um, New Mexico. We went to Milwaukee at our first council, then Mexico, then in Dharamsala, India, and then we went to uh, here in uh, Black Hills, and then to uh, Lincoln City, Oregon. Then we went to Japan. In between, we got invitations. I got invitations to go to um, Australia, Sweden. A lot of times I couldn't believe that I was doing this. I couldn't believe I was meeting people in the world that were so concerned about our condition. In Alaska, when we were at our council meeting, this Cherokee lady, she wanted to do a ride from White, uh, Red Clay, Tennessee, to here, to the Trail of Tears, to um, Tahlequah, Oklahoma and uh, then pick it up from there, from Oklahoma to, to Montana and arrive at my, my council meeting, 13 grandmas. So there was the horse riders, the horses waiting to go, volunteers waiting to, st to begin this ride, historical ride. So we started from here, from Fort Reno. 
It was so amazing, so, so pitiful to me, so heart, heartfelt. You know, that all these riders came, there were 18 of them and five horses, four Mustangs. They had a whole year to train these Mustangs, wild Mustangs. And, and you know, there were rescue horses. And Tess, the last horse, came. She was a Morgan. And I heard these touch me because even now when I talk about these horses being rescued, they had like a number on their necks. I said, like me, I have my enrollment number. Native Americans have enrollment numbers. I saw that. And then um, Tess came. She's a Morgan. And they said, Grandma, oh, Adrian Youngblood, she said, Grandma, I want you to write Tess, she's a Morgan. And I told her, I said, what is a Morgan horse, you know? And she said, Morgan horses are real, very good horses. She said, the soldiers rode these horses in the, gal uh, the cavalry, cavalry horse, cavalry soldiers rode these horses, Morgans. You know, here was the history of the soldiers, you know, the white people killing us. I even got an email through the, during my gathering time, uh, email was sent to me from, it was in the Library of Congress that, uh, take these Indians, and it had the Cheyenne to, to the reservation. If, if they don't, if they resist, kill them exterminate them. I, I was so touched by it. And I said, but still I'm here, I'm still here. My people's still here. And there was something very uh, peculiar, you know, when we started on the ride and here was the Morgan horse and here was these rescue horses and here was these white people and here was only two uh, Cheyennes riding the horse and different other tribes. And right away I thought to you, what are my Cheyenne people going to think, you know, on this ride? There's no, they're not all Cheyennes. I said, well, th you know, this is the Mahayana's way, Mahayana's way, God's way. It's not mine. I'm just going to go along with it. I'm going to walk with it. I'm going to let it tell me something, show me something. That was, I finally let go of myself and the way I saw things. And I said, okay, I'm letting it unfold. I want to see the unfolding. I, I began seeing all the um, focus on such hardship and, you know, the genocide and comparing it to now, today, to where I'm at. And that, that was, that was the beauty. But here was one story I heard uh, was that they, uh, 130 of them, and the leaders was Doll Knife and Little Wolf and North Woman. And that they, uh, s someone had said that the soldiers said, you know, they, they were surrounded by soldiers. And they said, oh, let them, let them get so far, let them think that they're really escaping. And then we'll go after them. That, that really touched me, you know, and to know that they actually made it under such conditions, you know, many outnumbered by soldiers, equipment, uh, even the, bull, um, um, the guns, 
They made it. How did they make it? And even the stories that I heard as this began to unfold was, oh, there was ceremonial people on the way. They, they um, made medicine and they um, performed miracles. They used the elements like one, one said that um, they used the fog. The fog got in between them and the soldiers. And then another one said uh, they used the animal trails to disguise their tracks. I mean, it's so beautiful, you know? Uh, nature and uh, Cheyenne. And, and they used um, how they used the land, how they used the animals, and the buffalo. They had buffalo robes, and they disguised themselves as buffalo. And the soldiers passed them up. They didn't even see them. Mm -hmm. And I even heard there was uh, the ones that stayed behind, they, they had ceremonies that they would make it. And I really believe that. I said this had to be through ceremonies and prayers. It's why the Cheyenne's still here, Arapahoes. We're still here today because of these ceremonies and the prayer. But getting the whole picture of the Cheyenne when they migrated from the north, where from the north they came through the Great Lakes, and that's what I found, that they were potters, too. There was pottery. Uh, they found that the Cheyenne made. And then they, they migrated through the plains. They were peace. The, my understanding and what I studied in the research was that they were peace for people. And, and I could say myself, you know, in the position that I was, that I'm in, that I came through in this world movement, they were on a mission. They migrated from the north, coming from the Great Lakes to here and meeting all these tribes, never gotten in a war with any of them, and came to the plains and made that their home in such, um, they were very, how do you say, flexible or very adaptable and very uh, courageous people. And you know, Alan Boyd wrote the book, Holding Stone Hands, he walked and his maps were the ones that we used. It, it, it was really, um, really, I'm not doing it justice because I cannot explain how it made me feel. Even there are people on the ride that transition, and they're telling me even today, they said, Grandma, we're writing a book. One is just about her. Uh, Adrian Youngblood's writing about her ride. She was one of the writers. Tess is her horse, the Morgan. And then there's another person that wrote just about the fire, the ceremonial fire. I mean, there, it is loaded, it is layered, and it's totally about historical trauma. And one grandma had this dream of 13 grandmothers. That's how we came into the world this world movement, and the Dalai Lama said, the world needed grandmothers. And so here we were in the new millennium. You know, is this all by accident? Is this coincidental? Is this meant to happen? This happened, hey, this happened. I'm sitting right here telling you, it happened. And this little effect in all of us, I hear school teachers say, well, Grandma, I want to do that you 
what you grandmas are doing. You're doing something great. What do you do? What else do you do? Oh, I volunteer at the hospital to read stories to patients. There you go. And you're a school teacher. You're teaching these children. I had great teachers. They taught me something. This is what I am today. <laughs>